Throughout the history of philosophy, women have been active, yet markedly absent from much of the scholarship. If you go into a bookstore or do a Google search for the greatest philosophers, you would most likely see one or two women, at most, on any given list. How can these two things coexist together? In ancient Greece and Rome, a few women were revered as philosophical teachers. Plato occasionally included women in his famous dialogues. In Alexandria, Egypt, daughters of scholars were educated, and one rose to prominence through her public lectures. In Han Dynasty, China, a female scholar was employed by the emperor to write on the role of women. Plagued by the looming accusations of witchery and devil worship, a woman in medieval France wrote a treatise on the nature of women and the empowerment of their traditional role. Across the ancient world into the medieval era, women held positions of expertise from which they advised, often other women, on how to lead a good life and fulfill their social role. What did these women write about? Join us today as we discuss these philosopher queens and their contributions to philosophy. Hey everybody and welcome to Open Door Philosophy. I am the watery Andrew. Watery, okay. (laughs) And I am the... Sunshiny Taylor Jones. Oh, there we water, go. Theme. <laughs> water and sun. What should I do? I'm the windy Derek Parsons. <laughs> and welcome to episode 77, where we will explore some of the most well known pre modern thinkers. But first, how is everybody doing? I'm good. I was saying before we hit record that I'm super busy because um, just finished week four of the semester. Um, But good busy. Yeah, classes are very busy. Lots of research papers looming in my very near future. I will be writing like I'm running out of time, a la Alexander Hamilton. (laughs) Um, (laughs) What else? Yeah, that's about it. I've had busy weekends the past couple of weeks, which is kind of out of the ordinary for me. Um, if you know me in like my personal life, I like to be very low key on the weekends, kind of like shut myself in my room and like disappear from the world. Oh, I didn't tell you all this, but when I was at the library on Wednesday a couple days ago, I was like, oh, I need to make the episode post. And my friend was like, the post for what? And I was like, oh, yeah, just like the podcast. And she was like, you have a podcast. So I was explaining to her. And then my other friend met us. And they were like, oh, my gosh. So they (laughs) were like, what's the Instagram? And they, like, followed and were commenting. So if y'all saw the comments, those are my friends. Oh, good. Shout out. Yeah, shout them out. Yeah, so that's Karis and Chloe. They're so sweet. But I was like, oh, my gosh. It's so, yeah. It's exciting, but also like weird uh-huh. when people from my like regular life listen. I don't know. Cause I'm like, Oh, just, yeah. Oh, that's yeah. cool. Uh, that's how this podcast spreads. So that's great. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's funny too. Um, when I talk about it with my students, mm-hmm. you know, uh, well, I mean, I, I'm sorry to say this, but no one remembers Andrew cause that mm. was like five or six years ago. Like those students were in middle school. And, uh, and Taylor, you're just kind of a, a name that sort of uh, floats around that no, no, people <laughs> might have heard of but have no real connection to. Yeah. <laughs> and then they listen to the show, you know, and they hear me yeah. and they know me. Uh, mm-hmm. But then hearing you two guys is kind of cool. So, um, yeah. 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 yeah well, that's I always see, I see when your students follow because it'll be like, blah, 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 just follow it and I'll go click. And it's like, <laughs> I'm going to high school, 2027. 20, and I'm like, oh, <laughs> that's so cute. <laughs> yeah. That's Parsons kids. <laughs> that makes me feel so old. <laughs> yeah. uh, hey, I'm the one who gets to whine about being old on this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'll catch up. Yeah. 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 I guess it's my, is it my turn? I guess it's. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, hi. Everything's good. Life's good. It's a cloudy, gloomy weekend. It's sort of rainy, uh, but sort of not. It's just really damp outside. Mm-hmm. We have a yard filled with dead plants uh, from the mm. freeze a couple of weeks ago that we need to clean up because all the new sprouts are already coming up out of the ground. Um, so we really need to clear out all that dead stuff. And it's been raining the last two weekends. We've had no real opportunity to do that. So, uh, But anyway, that's pretty exciting. I know. Mm-hmm. Uh, I have a few essays to grade this weekend, which oh. is sad, but it's not very many. And, uh, you know, the swans won. So that's Woo. great. All is well. How are you, Andrew? I'm doing good. The, this is 
also my first weekend in a while that I've been not like traveling or something. Mm-hmm. And so I'm catching up on a lot of nice social recharging, which is great. Mm-hmm. That's about it. It's been raining outside, so that's kind of depressing. And <laughs> and yeah, that's about it. You said your students were also talking about the podcast and Instagram. Yeah, that's that's, right, that's, that's funny. Yeah. yeah. I, I don't want to say anything else. <laughs> Andrew's yeah. like, I'm not saying anything more. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't want to uh, encourage, you know, I don't want to encourage these kind of behaviors. So um, <laughs> I'm a pretty mean teacher. If, if any of them are listening, they'll know. So, so yeah. Yeah, you really keep them in line? I don't know if I do, but I try. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I have a big poster in my classroom that says, all work, no fun. <laughs> that a student made for me. Yeah, so. That's hilarious. Oh, right, Taylor well, Swift, go. new album. Uh, Taylor, Swift. Taylor Swift has a new album coming out in April. Uh, April Taylor 19th. and I are very stoked. Andrew, Andrew is, is also so stoked. Wanting to stab his eyes <laughs> out with uh, some <laughs> with knitting needles or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, uh, the Eras Tour, Andrew, this is exciting for you. The Eras yeah. Tour movie is now exclusively streaming on Disney Plus. So if you want to catch it, uh, catch it, you know. Yeah, uh, March 15th. Yeah, March 15th. Um, Ours tour in birthday. Tokyo. Yeah. Um, Super Bowl is coming up. Super Bowl. Yeah, y'all watching Tomorrow? the Super Bowl? I'm protesting Andrew. Taylor Swift. <laughs> womp womp. Uh, no, what I a think lame excuse. I, I've bought into the I've bought into the conspiracy that the NFL is rigged just to get more views and they pushed the Chiefs to the Super Bowl. The Chiefs looked uh, awful this year. They they were not a good team. They did not have a good they were, season. They were not a good at all. They were actually extremely poor. And then somehow mm. they waltzed into the Super Bowl. Okay, what do you well, think? Not that they waltzed, reason? but uh, but they won. <laughs> they waltzed in. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. I didn't start watching football until like last week. I I just like Travis Kelsey. Yeah. There we go. That's he's, that's my reason. Whoa, whoa! But he's an endearing character. Have you listened to his podcast? No, I will not listen. <laughs> I'll send a clip. It's it's really sweet. I mean, like, to say that the NFL is trying to orchestrate things to get more people to watch is exactly what they should do. That's yeah, the that's what model. they should do. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, they shouldn't rig games. I don't think they're rigging games. Uh, mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, doing whatever they can do to uh, to promote things to get more people mm-hmm. to watch, especially in an era where uh, people are watching less sports. Mm-hmm. Yeah, NFL needs to do whatever they can. Yeah, they got all the Swifties on their side. Yeah, they do. Because we're all Chiefs fans now, apparently. <laughs> what a load of BS, you know. Like, like the Chiefs are such. They're they're going to be the next Patriots, and everybody's going to. Well, they're, they are. Yeah. They're not. They're not supposed is, to be loved. You're not supposed to love the the bandwagon know, team. Things. You know. Well, I have the luxury of not caring. I don't. The, know, you know, fell. So. The uh, the Patri- the the Chiefs are about to become the new. I well. The new Yankees or something. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Okay. That's, That's lingo. I understand. Yeah. We're like the Cowboys. Uh, the Yankees are yeah. like the 90s and 2000s. Yeah. 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 The Yankees, the Yankees are yeah. good, but I don't know anyone that really likes them. Yeah. But also mm. we live in Texas. So yeah. yeah. But like the Cowboys, I Cowboys. I learned this year that like they're not even that bad. Like they had a fairly good season, but everyone just clowns on them. Yeah, because they always I lose. They've won a they, Super Bowl in like lose. 30 years. They choke. They always are decent, and then they choke mm-hmm. away the Super Bowl somehow. Mm. Yep, yep. That's what I said yeah. to one of my one of my students, which was very inappropriate for me to say, probably. But when the he's a huge <laughs> Cowboys fan, I was giving him oh. a hard time when they <laughs> lost. <laughs> That's funny. Well, uh, I am going to a Super Bowl soiree. Um, nice. Of course, I'll only be there till about halftime. Then I'll go home because mm. I can't take it anymore. But uh, it will be the uh, it'll be the only NFL game I've watched this year. Mm. So that's my involvement with the NFL. Yeah, my friend who is do he's doing a PhD in chemistry and at University of North Carolina. He's coming to town, and I'm very excited. We were roommates, uh, oh. and so we're gonna probably go out tomorrow and. That's cool. I'm so super excited to see him. Yeah, oh, that's great. Well, this uh, episode, so you know, very timely, will come out a week after the Super Bowl yeah. has happened. So, yeah. <laughs> All right, we got to move on. Yeah. <laughs> we, do. we do need to move on. Let's talk about that newsletter, Andrew. Yeah, the newsletter. 
Yeah, super, super excited that we got the first one out about a week ago. So uh, if you go to the episode description right now or you go to the website or whatever, uh, you will be able to click a link that will subscribe mm-hmm. you and you'll get uh, one email, which will be a welcome email. And then sometime close to uh, around when this episode is released, I'm going to resend episode one for everybody new who subscribed. So not episode one. Uh, newsletter one newsletter one yes. so make sure to go do that yeah yeah, it'll be exciting yeah episode notes any extra tidbits if we mention like books or suggested readings um we'll try to link those for you yeah and just anything extra that we want to throw in there that would be helpful to you guys what do you say Andrew? smash that button is that yeah smash the like button or something smash the subscribe <laughs> button oh. okay well hey let's get on with the show so um like we said in the introduction we are starting a series on women in philosophy um we thought this would be really timely with women's history month and international women's day coming up just to spotlight some of the influential female thinkers and our personal favorites that are very near and dear to our hearts so this episode we are going to be covering diotima and hypatia so let's just get started with Diotima. And also, I want to plug Philosopher Queens. This yes. is, as you've heard me say, probably like every episode, Philosopher Queens, incredible. I love Lisa and Rebecca. They did an amazing job. And the first three thinkers, Diotima, Hypatia, and Ban Zhao are all included within the first couple entries in the Philosopher Queens. So if you are interested in anything we talk about here, I do encourage you to pick up the Philosopher Queens because it's incredible, a very great introduction to women in philosophy. And then they give a great index at the end of suggested readings for all the thinkers that they talk about. And then um, another list of other women that they just didn't have the space to cover. I want to plug that. Yeah. It's amazing. Let's just jump right in with Diotima. We have talked about Diotima a little bit on the podcast in episodes past. Um, I know we discussed her in one of our episodes on the philosophy of love. So if you're interested in a little bit more of her ideas on love, we'll talk about them here a little bit, but we do discuss more in depth love in that episode. So we'll link that and send out in the newsletter if y'all are interested in that. She was the only woman included in Plato's Symposium, and she discusses the nature of love and beauty with Socrates. She's not directly a participant in the Symposium. So what happens is in the Symposium, Socrates and a couple of his friends are together. They're drinking, and they're like, oh my gosh, let's discuss love. And so they all get up and they take turns giving speeches on what they think the nature of love is. And then Socrates gets up and he's like, okay, guys, I have this story about this woman named Diotima who taught me about the ladder of love. And this goes along into Plato's ideas of the good, the true, and the beautiful and like the highest forms of things emulating the good. She is widely regarded by scholars to just have been a character that Plato made up as a literary device to exemplify what it means to be a good philosopher. There are scholars that think that she did exist, but I think it's still significant to talk about her, whether she existed or not. Um, Mm -hmm. And I wanted to get y'all's thoughts on does it matter if she existed or didn't exist and why, if you think yes. If I'm remembering right, was she from Egypt? That's Hypatia. Oh, it's Hy- no. I th- well, yes, I know Hypatia is from oh. Egypt, but I thought maybe Diotima was I'm not also. Sure. Yeah, she's a she's a, described as a foreigner from mm, Mantinea, okay. which is a city, another city in Greece, I believe. Oh, okay, so it's not Egypt. Okay. She's a she's not from Athens. Yeah, she might have that. She could have been. There's speculation around that time. She could have been like a priestess or an oracle or mm-hmm. something like that. Mm-hmm. So, but definitely a foreigner to Athens. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Well, here's my take on your question. I don't think it matters whether she was real or not. I know that sounds kind of funny, mm-hmm. but here's the deal. The symposium also isn't real. Yeah. <laughs> the symposium. I mean, if the symposium happened, uh, it certainly didn't happen like this. Mm-hmm. And we all know in, in Plato's dialogues, he casts characters who are named after real people. Right. But what those characters say in his dialogues are not specifically mm-hmm. what those 
people, act, real people actually said. Sure. And so I would be interested to know why he chose her if she is, mm-hmm. in fact, fictional. Um, I think that would be interesting to note. I should have looked that up in uh, Robin Garfield's you. Play-Doh. That's what I'll talk about. No, you that. got me. Okay, okay. Um, but but I don't know that it necessarily matters whether she's real or not. So it's still philosophy. I'm still doing philosophy. It is significant, I think, though, that that uh, that he does cast a, a woman in this role. Uh, mm-hmm. So I think Andrew has something to say about that. Yeah, I'm convinced that she's fictional. And I, I don't know if it matters or not. I think it it's interesting that he does cast her as a woman. And I will give my explanation of this here. So, so diatema, this name in Greek means one who honors the God. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so what is she doing when she's talking, when she's giving this whole dialogue on on love and beauty. Well, she's honoring something. She's honoring an ideal, the most beautiful of things. And she's discussing mm-hmm. things like truth and beauty and goodness, all things which Plato would say is the ideal. And I mm-hmm. think eventually she gets to the point that, you know, uh, the discussion of these things, somebody who understands these things, this is the greatest kind of love. And so I think she is a symbol in the book of, of someone the, the best thing to kind to love as uh, some something to love or um, you know she's wise whatever uh, and she's contrasted with I th- and I think sh- uh, her role you know she's connected with the Socrates guy who's somewhat famous a big part of the symposium is this discussion between Alcibiades and Socrates mm-hmm. because uh, Alcibiades wants to get with Socrates and Socrates says no blah 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 and mm-hmm. if Socrates talked about all of these things about love and beauty and goodness and all of these things and then got with Alcibiades we would see he's a hypocrite but mm-hmm. he doesn't mm-hmm. Alcibiades he has a fictional I believe as well female companion kind of uh, who is not interested in you know these greater things in the world. And her name is Tamandra. What does Tamandra mean? It means one who honors the man, one who honors mm. the person. And so I think uh, Diatima huh. is a foil to this woman, as, mm-hmm. a, as a symbol of Socrates who honors the gods with his mm-hmm. speech and his goodness. And he's huh. learning from this woman who's honoring the gods in her pursuit of wisdom and truth and beauty. And people like Alcibiades, who worship the physical, honor the man. And Diatema, obviously, mm. is a great figure that he reveres. So that's my take. She's fictional or not, I don't know. It doesn't matter. But honoring that, honoring this great female uh, who's giving us this wisdom, I mean, I think that is cool. I think it's significant he does cast a woman into this role and that Socrates praises her so highly. I was like, this woman is one of the pinnacles of wisdom. And she helped me learn the Socratic method of question and answer and how I do philosophy. And like, I don't know, illustrating this idea that a woman could have taught him something when, especially in the ancient world, women were often not educated. They didn't have citizenship at all in Athens, Mm, just regarded like not super highly in that Socrates who, um, even though he didn't have high social standing in Athens, but he did have philosophical influence, would regard a woman so highly. Yeah, and I also think it's interesting from a literary perspective, women, of course, women are cast as characters in uh, in Greek plays and dramas. Mm-hmm. So it's not like they're mm-hmm. a, a stranger to being portrayed in, in fiction. And of course, like, you know, the, obviously, um, you know, the, the Homeric epics. Mm-hmm. But women aren't typically cast as just really great. They're, they're kind of a slave to their passions, and they make very poor decisions because of that. And so, mm-hmm. and not not exclusively, of course. But you know, you look at Medea and uh, yeah. compare with. I don't know. That's just kind of interesting to think about. Yeah, Medea is also what came to mind. That she was incredibly passionate and driven mad by the actions of her husband, and portrayed in a very unsympathetic way. In similar in the Odyssey and the Iliad that one of the only women that's portrayed as wise is Athena and the mm-hmm. other women. Yeah. The, the goddesses are, are usually wise. Yeah. Well, well, Athena especially, but yeah. 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 But the other women are sedu- seductresses and they're fickle and they just want to, you know, hold the men hostage. Just generally not 
positive representations of women, but at the, a very similar time, you have Plato portraying a woman in this way, which I think is really interesting. Yeah, right? let me uh, let me say one last thing. Maybe, and I, this is from your point, Taylor, about the kind of the gods in, in the past. Mm-hmm. And well, if we think that it's true that Diotima or whatever is some kind of, I mean, she talks a lot in the symposium about sacrifice and mm-hmm. a lot of these purifications and a lot of these priestly or I guess priestessly duties. And so if we're thinking about her role as a as an oracle or a, a priestess, mm-hmm. I mean, these would be the women in Greek society who are not seen as, you know, mm-hmm. they would be seen as essential. Yeah. Oh, sure. They would be seen as the ones who make, they are the ones who advise the men. They are the mm-hmm. ones who give the lessons from the gods. And mm-hmm. so she, if she was a priestess, she would have this very unique and special mm-hmm. duty. Uh, and so in a way, and I think that Socrates describes her, and this is he's such a beautiful writer too, uh, she is someone who gives birth to the beautiful. Mm-hmm. She yeah. opens this idea as a woman. She's giving birth mm-hmm. to the beautiful from the gods as her role as an oracle or a, a priestess. Mm-hmm. It's beautiful. Yeah. Mm-hmm. In, in um, the Apology, Socrates also talks about the Oracle of Apollo, which from my understanding, oracles are typically female. Yep. Um, that, yep. And he reveres her words Yep. Um, that he's the wisest man and he puts them, he tests what she says and comes to the conclusion she must be right. So we do see in at least one other place that Plato or Socrates have reverence for women in these positions, um, which I think is interesting. And it's nice to see women portrayed in um, that manner, especially from like a piece that's from so long ago. Do I think we should discuss a little bit the ladder of love before we move on, because that's her um, main sure. contribution that we have. Mm-hmm. So like we've mentioned in this episode and before, the ladder of love is primarily an abstraction from the most basic or like rudimentary ideas of love or affection or desire. And as you go up, it's a bit of a ladder of, of abstraction. So the highest form is love for beauty itself. And at the bottom, we have love of one individual body. And so from love of the body, you go up to love of all beautiful bodies. And then above that, you have love of the beauty a soul can have. So getting a little bit more abstract, a little less physical. And then you have love for beautiful public institutions. So the systems that have been crafted in a way to achieve a certain end. And then above that, she places love for knowledge in general, which I think is really interesting that And it plays along with what Plato conveys in a lot of his works, that enlightenment and knowledge and bettering the soul are what should be desired above physical things. And then at the top, she has love for beauty itself. And that aims at this platonic ideal of the good, the true, and the beautiful, of searching um, and aiming towards something that's higher, something that transcends the physical world and that's much less temporal. No comments? Oh, I have comments. I'm coming on, Andrew. <laughs> no, go ahead. Well, no, exactly what I want to say. <laughs> um, but, you know, I always have something to say. Mm-hmm. I think it was last episode, actually, where I was talking about how I was carrying on when I teach, uh, after I teach Plato, how, like, mm-hmm. basically I'm just drunk or high on, on, <laughs> on Plato because I think it's so, yeah. so wonderfully just beautiful, all of it, the yeah. whole system, whether or not it's. It's all correct. I don't know. But boy, it's beautiful. And um, just thinking about this ladder of love and how mm-hmm. it all works. And I was thinking uh, to uh, another philosopher came uh, 400 years, maybe 300 years after Plato. Uh, Platonus, mm-hmm. talks, who is a Neoplatonist, talks about beauty uh, as well in his book. And it's just you read it and you're like, well, you know, does any of this make any literal sense? Not really. Um, but yeah. <laughs> but it's so beautiful to read. And it's such a beautiful idea that you can't help admire it. But uh, I mm-hmm. think the ladder of love is is really a, a, a wonderful way to represent Plato's ideas of, of hierarchy, mm-hmm. right? Ascending hierarchies, whether that's the tripartite soul or but but anyway, yeah, I think the latter yeah. love is, is one of his best examples of this idea of ascending mm-hmm. towards truth and beauty and good. 
Yeah, I like it's one of the most uh, influential ideas in the in philosophy. Yeah, I think the last thing I want to say before we move on to Hypatia is that in Zoe Aliozzi's article in the Philosopher Queen, she talks about Diotima's emphasis in passing on your knowledge, and that, like Andrew was saying, that there's an aspect of like pregnancy of knowledge, and that your role should be to pass on and give what you've learned and all of the knowledge that you collected should be passed on and given to others, which I think is, it's such a beautiful, I don't know, way to think about going about life that you would have spent so much time studying and growing your soul. And then in that, you're also passing on all the work that you've done so that more people can continue learning and can continue growing and pursuing this ideal of beauty and truth and good long after you've passed away. Yeah, it's great commentary on what the role of the philosopher is mm-hmm. and, uh, and and what philosophy should do, right? It reminds me kind of of, um, you know, the end of the allegory of the cave when mm-hmm. um, uh, Glaucon, right? Yeah, when Glaucon mm-hmm. uh, is mm-hmm. asked, well, you know, what should the, uh, what should the released prisoner do? stay outside, you know, and all this, uh, the world of forms mm-hmm. or it's all wonderful. Not that it's the world of forms, but, or, or go back into the cave. Plato's quite clear about it. Mm-hmm. You go back in the cave. And I think he says, go down there and share in their troubles and their honors, whether they're worth having or not. Mm-hmm. All right. So I think we should move on to Hypatia. She was an Egyptian woman who lived in Alexandria, which is a city in the Roman Empire that was really famous for its libraries, for its university, that just a very big center of education and culture and learning, flourishing. And she was said to have lived about 350 to 415 CE during the Roman Empire. And this was a time when Rome was very influenced by Hellenism, but it also had its own culture and some powerful women. I'm also pulling a lot from the Philosopher Queen's article on her just because there's not a lot of information out there and we can talk about this a little more. Hypatia was known for giving public philosophical um, lectures of a sort and she also had a lot of mathematical contributions. She studied under her father Theon um, who was a great mathematician and astronomer and She learned a lot about those things from him, directly studying under him. And then it was said that she was she grew past his understanding in philosophical topics and had some contributions to Neoplatonism. In the years since, all of that has been lost. And that does make me wonder how much of it may have been because of the fire at the Library of Alexandria, if there would have been more or really any of her direct work that was left had the library not burned down. And then since then, she's become a central figure in poetry and literature and art. And there's even a movie about her or like with her as a character. Hmm. So she's become a bit of a feminist figure and a feminist icon for enlightenment and knowledge and pursuing a higher good, even when it's directly in the face of what the government is doing and criticism, which I think is really important. Similar to Diotima, that although Hypatia did exist, but really nothing of her own work survives, she's still cemented as this really powerful figure, like someone to look up to, someone to emulate, and that she still stands with a legacy, although there's not much of her left. There's so much of the ancient world that is lost yeah. to history. Mm-hmm. I mean, the the actual rarity is when something survives. Yeah. Like so much of Aristotle's loss, so much mm-hmm. of, I mean, a lot of the philosophers we have, it's, it's, we know about them from other writings and we have yeah. just the scantest of fragments from them. Uh, yeah. The fire of mm-hmm. Alexandria uh, library was, I mean, I, who knows? I wasn't there. It's always been described <laughs> as a, as a really, terrible yeah. loss to mm-hmm. knowledge and Alexandria at the time really was as far as the Mediterranean world goes was kind of the center at this time mm-hmm. like the center of knowledge and education academia yeah. so so no doubt if it, if her works were there uh, or any works that were there in that library that the mm-hmm. that library burning down was a significant loss 
I wonder how much more. I mean, we know this. I, I mean, we know this, but uh, all of the texts that are mentioned in uh, Greek mm-hmm. literature and early Christian and uh, Roman literature that could have survived yeah. if that library was there. A lot of work from Cicero was lost forever, and a lot of these greats. So that that would be. I wonder how different the world would yeah. be. Yeah, probably know that. how the pyramids are built. It's preserved. <laughs> <laughs> Yep. Aliens. <laughs> yeah, I think it's really, I mean, it's really unfortunate that we lost so much and we can only sit here and wonder what we could have known had this great library not burned down or things not been lost in transit and all of those different things. Um, and like Mr. Parsons was saying, pretty much everything that's known about diatoma or not diatoma about Hypatia is known through other people's letters of her, whether that's her father's writings about the work that they did or her students. That's kind of all that's left is other people referencing her in their discussions with other people. One thing that is attributed to her is that she helped chart celestial bodies and create the hydrometer, which helped measure the density of liquids, I think. And then her mathematic contributions, I couldn't Mm -hmm. find exactly what that was, but from what I found, they were picked up going into the early modern era by um, thinkers like Descartes and other scholars who were working on mathematics and creating like the new math or like developing calculus, things like that. But her mathematical contributions are part of what is known about her, but her philosophy is completely lost. In an article from the Smithsonian, they quoted the philosopher Damasius, I think that's how you pronounce that, who wrote after her death that, quote, donning the robe of a scholar, the lady made appearances around the center of the city, expounding in public to those willing to listen on Plato or Aristotle, end quote. And what I found, she did lecture on the teachings of influential philosophers like Plato and Aristotle and some other thinkers who are around kind of in the same time and that that's what she was known for um, teaching about. I just wonder like how much did she talk about that we will just never know? <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, I know. It's so great to think about. I, I too have read that she spoke frequently on, on lessons on Plato and Aristotle. Mm-hmm. I don't know. It's just a really great thing to think about that. that I also think about, you know, how much people learned by, by lectures back then, mm-hmm. not necessarily lectures as we think of them now, but you know how yeah. many people had access to written materials, mm-hmm. and so for Hypatia to be out in the public square giving lessons on Plato and Aristotle is just a very uh, romantic idea to me. I like it. Mm-hmm. That was a thing uh, back then. I think uh, we we we're reading the old mm-hmm. uh, Socratic dialogues. There's a lot of discussion about the public lectures in Rome. We know that was a thing mm-hmm. too. Mm-hmm. The early homilies of the church, which uh, I don't know if we want to get into this now, how she dies, but uh, we know St. Cyril, Cyril of Alexander, that these yeah. Alexandrians were really crazy people. And so in his uh, in his own homilies, he was yeah. telling them, chill the Yeah, heck that's out. what I had up next on my yeah, um, go for it. notes to talk about. There's one other thing I was going to mention. Yeah, go. Oh, about public philosophy, that before mm. most of the populace was literate, People would stand out in the like squares and um, teach or preach, even into like the 1700s. You see it in the United oh, States yeah. with preachers traveling around, and they would just stand in the public square and give addresses, and thousands of people would come to listen. And I think it's interesting that now philosophy is a bit, not even a bit, um, but a good bit more individualized. Like unless you're in a university setting, you're going to have to study philosophy on your own or kind of create a, a group of people to study with. And it's not as much like a public activity to go and listen to thinkers the same way it used to be. Yeah. And then like Andrew was saying, she was violently murdered by a mob of Christian zealots from what I could find. In The Philosopher Queens, I believe it's Lisa Whitting who wrote the article on Hypatia, but she says that Hypatia was the first female martyr to philosophy. She was an easy target because she was a pagan woman who spoke publicly about non-Christian philosophy. And then rumors circled that she was 
preventing Orestes and Cyril from settling their differences. So this mob of people attacked her carriage on her way traveling back home. And I found like a few different accounts, but they all pretty much say that she was pulled from the carriage and attacked with either like pottery or roof tiles and they killed her and then kind of publicly displayed that which yeah very such a brutal time you know we talk, yeah. we talk about like oh the oh ancients and, oh you know we have such a great view of them mm-hmm. and like it was also such a brutal time yeah, yeah this is also fourth century uh so mm-hmm. the christian church is really as far as the mediterranean goes is really beginning to solidify into uh, a, a cohesive movement mm-hmm. there were still these no, anyway, I just I just think that's that's interesting. Um, yeah, that's how it went down. It's kind mm-hmm. of similar. I mean, it's easy to make a uh, an allusion to Socrates here, mm-hmm. who was also cited for uh, abandoning the gods or creating mm-hmm. false gods or anyway, whatever it was. It wasn't the standard, right? You know, the standard religious view at the time. And uh, same here with Hypatia. It's similar fate. When I was looking into research about her, I think for some historical context. Mm-hmm. What do we call it? The governor of Alexandria. He was mm-hmm. per, he was killing a lot of Christians around the time, uh, and she was mm-hmm. friends mm-hmm. or close associates with this guy. And so I think the the Christians yeah. uh, <laughs> took her down. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I think there was big big riots between the the Christians who were mm-hmm. being killed or something. Yeah. And so yeah, very brutal. The and brutal this is not to go. long before the life of like. St. Augustine, who writes and becomes like the Bishop of Hippo and then suffers. Oh, I think he may predate her by a little bit. Does not he? much, not much. Okay, not I was much. thinking yeah, but, uh, I think a little he bit does. after, like kind of in the same time that he. That's, he yeah, died. it's the same time period. Yeah, like, but then he also suffers not the same fate, but he dies in a very brutal um, siege or like invasion of Hippo. Christians and pagan thinkers alike were. Suffering very, very horrible fates. No. <laughs> That's not a yeah, it wasn't a fun time. <laughs> not a fun time. It wasn't a fun time to be alive. On one hand, I'm like, oh, I just love that the idea that all oh, these people were in the, giving public lectures mm-hmm. and you know, that <laughs> Alexandria was the center of academia and scholarship. And mm-hmm. you know, then there's also this. <laughs> Okay, everyone. Well, thanks so much for tuning in today. I hope you really enjoyed it, and we appreciate you listening. Let us know your thoughts, either at our, our email at contact at opendoorphilosophy.com or over on Instagram at opendoorphilosophy. Let us know your favorite female philosophers, because that's a personal curiosity of mine. Yeah, make sure you hit the subscribe button on YouTube and slam the subscribe button in our description for the newsletter. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. And follow us on Instagram to stay updated. Yeah. Well, I don't... What's another one? I think it's... Poke. Poke. Poke poke the follow button. No, no. We don't want to poke. Poke the follow button. (laughs) No poking? (laughs) I don't know. That just sounds weird. (laughs) I'll look at it. Okay. Yeah, well, more slam violent. sounds worse, yeah, I you know, think. Violent. It's going to be violent. Yes. Hit, slam hit sounds... that subscribe button. <laughs> Whack. <laughs> Thwack it. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yes, yeah. okay, we've gone too far. Okay, okay. anyways, um, help us come up with a better adjective. Um, yeah, let us know or, that on Instagram. Yeah, onomatopoeia. <laughs> verb or something. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, what would it be? Wham. Wham. <laughs> Snackle. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Anyways, uh, yeah, do all those things. Thank you to Kevin McLeod for the music that's playing right now and in our introduction. Mm-hmm. And remember, when your life is in need of some philosophy, the door is always open. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye.